Welcome everyone. This is such an exciting group to come together. Um, we are here because each of us knows that now is the time to reclaim our energy system, to end the fossil fuel era and to power up climate solutions. Today, we're gonna to talk about the power up mobilization on the 3rd and 4th of November, why it's happening, what it's gonna look like around the world, and then most importantly, the next steps of how you can be a powerful part of it. I'm Bridget, I'm proud to work for 350.org. I'm Director of Movement Support, and I'm gonna be holding the space for us today. Um, first of all, I really wanna know who you are. Where are you joining us from? So jump in the Zoom chat, tell us your name, where you're based, any group you're affiliated to. And if you can't find the chat function, have a little look under the three circles that say more. Um, and we're gonna kick off today a wonderful part of us being here together is we're gonna have a visual facilitator who's gonna draw live during the webinar, the vision that's coming together from across the world. She is the super skilled Ira Mayatens, and she's a member of the Visual Harvesting Collective. Um, and I want to know that you can get involved too at the end of this call. If I know you're going to stick around to the end, we're going to have a special action moment together. So prepare for that. And you might need a pen and paper because you'll need it later. So grab that. Um, can I check if Iris is able to share your screen and be able to start seeing the beginning of the light, the drawing that we're, you're going to do for us as our vision comes together? Hi, you should see me. Um... I've got the now is the time right uh, right up as the beginning screen. And um, I can also put myself bigger and smaller, but I'm going to put myself really small for the rest of the call. And you'll just see me um, build up the drawing as we go. So yes, everything that I hear and um, all the big takeaways I'll be drawing. And um, you can pin my screen whenever you want to really kind of focus in on, on what I'm doing. Lovely, lovely. Thank you so much. So happy to have you here. Um, so this call is going to go on for about an hour. We'll have powerful climate and social justice leaders speaking from around the world about why they're partnering to power up. And then we'll have a moment for your participation at the end. All the resources you need for Power Up are already on the website, Global Power Up, and a recording of this call we shared with you afterwards. Um, it is great to see hundreds of people joining this call. I'm really stoked. Um, and on our action map, we already have 100 actions registered from around the world. Um, so we're going to move over to hear our speakers. Welcome, speakers. Can you say hi? Give us a wave. Lovely. Our first two speakers, they're going to talk to us about our first part of this call, which is why we should reclaim fossil fuel profits and get control over the industry. So I'm really delighted to introduce our first speaker. Fabiana Ferreira Alves is a feminist and activist and a campaigns lead at ActionAid International. She's recently been playing a pivotal role in the launch of ActionAid's new global campaign, Fund Our Future. That's calling on banks to divest from fossil fuels and harmful agribusiness practices. So she's gonna take us through some of the, the findings from that report. Uh, Fabiana, over to you. Thank you very much, Bridget. And hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if it works. Is everybody seeing it? I think so, right? Okay. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the work we are doing at ActionAid uh, that is uh, super connected with the work that 350 is doing too. And uh, we are we just launched in September the Fund Our Future campaign. And it has all to do about uh, how to do open campaigns and rooted campaigns, listen to movements, listen to people that are in the ground and then transform that in a campaign. So always having feedbacks and understanding what are the needs because the solutions uh, to stop the climate crisis, they are in the ground, they exist, they're already there. 
but uh, because of years of uh, colonization, years of, uh, um, of a harmful way of looking at the economy and uh, uh, two people relations uh, that was uh, uh, made invisible for everybody. So by through talking uh, to our campaign, I'm going to talk a little bit about those uh, solutions we can have. So our campaign, Fund Our Future, is thinking about moving billions out of climate crimes and into community-led solutions. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, on-the-ground projects uh, looking at uh, renewable energy that uh, is led by women and agroecology. So we want uh, the divestment from uh, fossil fuels and industrial agriculture culture that is damaging lives and mobilize funding for community solutions. Uh, we want to empower people to stand against financing for harm for agribusiness and fossil fuels and towards those real solutions. Uh, we have done this campaign, started in September. It is a global campaign. Uh, we, we are supporting a youth, le youth leadership. Uh, we did a report, uh, Vanessa Nakate, uh, also this amazing uh, woman youth leader uh, talking about climate. Uh, she supported us in the report. We went to Kenya because uh, we had a lot of climate meetings in Kenya and uh, we supported also together with other NGOs to do the People Climate Assembly, uh, a parallel event so that we were talking about uh, uh, how to stop the climate crisis by bringing solutions in the ground that are led by, um, by the people that are already doing it looking at agroecology, looking at renewables, asking for uh, stopping the fossil fuels industry. And uh, in the report uh, we launched in September, we had some uh, important discoveries. Uh, so the industry in the global south reached an estimate of 3.2 trillion in the seven years since the Paris Agreement on Climate Change was adopted. Bank financing provided to the largest, largest industrial agriculture companies operating the global south amounted to 370 billion over the same period. And banks have provided an annual average of 20 times more financing to fossil fuels and agriculture activities in the global south than global north governments uh, have provided as climate finance to countries on the front lines of the climate crisis. So um, we are asking for banks actually to stop the divest to stop the investments on fossil fuels and harmful industrial agri agribusiness and we are thinking and asking governments all over the world uh, for solutions and for support and subsidies for renewable energy and agroecology so we are looking for uh, alternative futures uh, for a change in the way the finance system is orchestrated right now a little bit about the launch we did in Nairobi. Uh, so we launched the climate justice campaign and the flagship report of the People's Climate Assembly, as I already said. So just for you to take a look on how it went. And uh, in this campaign, we want to show the harm, but also the solutions inside the communities, right? Uh, so we are in 2023 and 2024, we are looking at the strategies uh, for media and campaigns work, uh, looking at those harms. We want to expose the harms that are being made, but also show the solutions uh, from fossil fuels and industrial agribusiness. Those are the countries that we are focusing, but we are a federation formed and we are in more than 70 territories. Those are some of the banks that we are thinking about uh, targeting next year. Those are one of the banks that uh, are investing the most in fossil fuels and agribusiness in the world, especially in the global south, because our report is looking to the global south. So for 2024, uh, we are looking and we want to, we expect to have more allies and the people also by our side. Uh, 
uh, to look at this, uh, the narrative that we are building, support us, um, look at how those investments are happening and try to stop those investments and uh, create a collaborative work uh, with the movement so we can bring a new uh, world, a new future for the future um, generations. So thank you very much. Uh, and it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Fabiana. Shocking, so much money flowing from banks to fossil fuels in the majority world. Uh, I'm really shocked by that. Um, and I'm going to pass over to um, the next section of our call, um, where we're going to be looking at really uh, why now is the time for a renewable energy revolution. Um, we know that our governments need to have a plan to hold the fossil fuel industry accountable. We know in November that fossil fuel companies will have the audacity to release the latest round of their obscene record-breaking profits. And while people are struggling, struggling with climate impacts, struggling with skyrocketing energy and food prices, and we know that governments need to take control, take control of these profits that fossil fuel companies are making through all the financial mechanisms that they can, through ending fossil fuel subsidies, through stopping direct investments, um, through windfall taxes, um, these are some of the bare minimums that can help to power down the fossil fuel industry and help us to power up for the renewable energy that we need. Um, our next section is going to be looking at why now is the time not just to mobilise against fossil fuels, but why we also need to mobilise for renewables um, on the 3rd and 4th of November at Power Up. Um, and I'm going to kick us off, and I'm grateful to David Jones from Ember, from which I learned a lot of about this. Um, every climate and energy model shows that the absolute fastest way to cut fossil fuel use is to build renewable electricity. And we need to triple global renewables by 2030 to get us on track for those 1.5 degrees of warming that will keep us on a livable planet. Solar and wind at the moment already produce about 12% of the world's electricity last year. And within the decade, by 2030, that needs to look like 40% of our global electri electricity needs coming from solar and wind. And that's possible. And if we do that, along with better energy efficiency, it means that we can cut global fossil fuel use by two thirds. And that isn't fanciful optimism. That's the International Energy Agency saying that. A two-third fall in gl global fossil fuel use in a little over a decade is possible. And the most critical part of that is tripling renewables and improving energy efficiency. So the International Panel on Climate Change, that is the official United Nations body for climate change science, showed us clearly in their report that of all the solutions to cut carbon emissions, solar and wind are the biggest, cheapest tools that we have in our toolbox today. And governments are already getting this message. There are lots of governments, Netherlands, Denmark, Australia, Portugal, who are planning for 100% of their electricity to be clean by 2030. But over, and in somewhere like China, over half of global renewables are being installed there. And it's the reason why China is starting to halt their coal power. There's a proposal right now from the COP28 presidency that at the next UN Global Climate Talks, which is coming up this December, that they will seek an agreement to triple global renewables. And we really need to get governments to support this. This is an opportunity right now on the table. But governments, are, they're hesitating on renewables. They're hesitating on renewables because two reasons. Fossil fuel companies, they champion just dangerous distractions, things like hydrogen, carbon capture. And we together have to tell governments that not just that renewables is a solution, but it is the solution. The second reason governments are hesitating about renewables is because of the fundamental and 
historical injustices of the world's financial system. To, to make that tripling of renewable energy that the world needs, it would take four to five trillion US dollars every year. But last year, that investment in clean energy, it's it's only at 1.7 trillion. It's, it's one fifth of the way that we need to go. So we have to come together to fight for the financial system to be transformed so that we bring justice to this renewable energy revolution. When you need to borrow money to build those renewables, rich countries are paying an interest rate of just 4% on average. But that skyrockets. It skyrockets to 15% interest rates for countries who are in the majority world. Affordable money, like grants, low-cost finance, that's a tiny percent, just 1% of all the money being offered to fund renewables is affordable money. So funding must flow from those that are most historically responsible for the climate emergency to those most impacted by it. We call for a transition that goes beyond replacing one broken energy system with another. I want to see energy ownership that redistributes power from the few to the many. We are familiar with saying no to things, but we need to find our voice to say yes collectively. We need to fight for the climate solutions to focus on building, not just closing stuff down. We need to say, yes, bring it here, bring it to my backyard. And we need to visibly show our support for the renewable energy revolution. We need to demand that rich governments, fossil fuel companies, investors pay up so the whole world can power up. So that is my introduction to why now is the time for a renewable energy revolution and for mobilizing on the 3rd and 4th of November. So I am going to introduce our next speaker there. I am honored to introduce Jacinta Fatamawa. She is an Australian born Samoan woman currently working as 350's Pacific Team Regional Campaigner. She's working also with Pacific Climate Warriors and she's going to share with us right now how and why they're powering up in Oceania. Jacinta, over to you. Thanks, Bridget. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so um, it's 11.30pm for me, um, but it uh, feels really cool to be in community with everyone all over the world. It was really cool to see where everyone's uh, joining in from in the chat. But for the Pacific, I guess I can quickly share the Pacific Island countries have uh, historically punched above its weight, displaying climate leadership that's often lacking from our rich and high emitting countries. Um, and so while we are fighting uh, the worst of the climate crisis, we're also trying to realize our own just uh, energy transition. Uh, but the journey of this work and of the movement has seen our communities uh, always at the forefront of solutions. And a great example of that Pacific climate leadership is the Port Villa Corps for a just transition to a fossil fuel free Pacific, uh, which clearly demands for a dramatically scaling up of the deployment of uh, renewable energy and energy efficient technologies across all sectors, doing that alongside with the phasing out of all fossil fuels. Um, but yes, we know that the fossil fuel dependence is still uh, a region wide economic burden and a challenge to um, our energy security. However, we also know that community led uh, energy has the potential to alleviate that burden for our Pacific communities, giving us a uh, autonomy over our own energy security and resilience. Um, we know that we have to continue that pressure on the in fossil fuel industry while also ensuring that the Pacific have everything they need uh, in the face of the climate crisis. And that process must be ethical and not cause like further harm to communities or our environment. So that that transition to renewable energy must not perpetuate the crimes of the fossil fuel industry. And a classic meme of that is Australia hiding behind renewable energy goals, but also being like one of the world's largest exporters of coal and gas, uh, which is just like bad maths. Um, but this is where we've arrived as a network, as a community and as a movement where the Pacific Climate Warriors are powering up our future and committing to build 
uh, to building a world where Pacific peoples can thrive. Uh, so for this upcoming Global Day of Action, um, the Pacific region, Oceania, are displaying a series of community actions. Um, and I think the last time I checked, it's, we've got 12 countries that have signed up. Um, that's not just from like the Pacific region, but this is also our Pacific communities in the diaspora. Um, and it's got that with the focus of the role of Australia's fossil fuel industry in the region and uh, the history of our coal and gas campaigns, we know that this is a really, really big opportunity for our communities to power up for climate solutions. But um, our showpiece event that will be accompanying these distributed actions is in partnership um is in partnership with indigenous uh, an indigenous community in new south wales in australia uh the gomore traditional owners um, and their lands have been hugely impacted by both santos gas and uh, white haven coal um, but we're doing a special tour connecting indigenous communities on the front lines of the extraction of the fossil fuel industry to the communities like ours who are on the front lines of impact um, but yeah, it feels super exciting to see how our journey of our region's contribution to the movement, our communities on the ground have shared some really creative tactics already on um, that really connect to our showpiece events, uh, visually, culturally, um, arty, I don't know, and through story. But um, yeah, I guess it's, it, there's a lot of appetite for our network to be a part of this global community for this global day of action uh, who have just come out of doing a lot of community recovery and rebuilding capacity for this work. But um, yeah, we'll be able to create special moments that as a collective, we'll be able to uh, uplift Pacific climate leadership um, on the grassroots level as well as on a regional government's level. Uh, we'll also be able to continue to highlight the hypocrisy of the Australian government who are bidding to become a renewable energy champion um, and we'll also be able to lay down that foundation of the importance of intentional ongoing relationships with Indigenous groups and with our comrades and partners in the movement. But the Pacific Islands Forum is also coming up and so we see this as a really good opportunity to send a message to the Australian government that they need to choose a side, either the side with uh, the continued destruction of the fossil fuel industry or with the communities and power up for our futures. So that's um, our plans in a nutshell. Back to you, Bridget. Pick a side. Are you with the fossil fuel industry's destruction or are you with the indigenous leaders of this world? Thank you, Jacinta. Um, uh, now I am really delighted to have the phenomenal Zaki Mamdu to speak next. He's the campaign coordinator of Stop ECOP. That's the grassroots fight to stop a massive oil pipeline right through the heart of East Africa. And they're looking at how solutions could also be a tool of resistance in their struggle. Zaki, over to you. Thanks, thanks so much, Bridget. And uh, greetings to everyone, uh, comrades, friends, colleagues. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you and thank you for the opportunity to speak and, and thanks to the previous speakers as well. Um, so look, mine is, is really just some reflections that, that I hope to share with everyone here. Uh, reflections, like like Bridget said, looking at um, the the ways in which a solutions narrative and focus and approach could not have come at a better time uh, for the African continent and 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 for the African climate justice movement, uh, but also some some thoughts around how um, this 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 kind of shift, uh, or at least integration of of a, a focus on. Uh, renewable energy solutions to the climate crisis uh, is very much a form of, of resistance. Um, so when we think of resistance, we, we often envision, you know, people on the streets raising their voices against uh, oppressive regimes, uh, you know, always fighting against something and opposing some sort of, of, of imposition and some form of injustice. Um, and in the context of, of the climate justice movement, that is often exactly what resistance has looked like. Uh, in the case of the Stop ECOP campaign, and for those who don't know, this is a, a campaign that was launched uh, some years back to confront the construction of what would be the world's longest heated crude oil pipeline. 
um, the East African crude oil pipeline, which spans a distance of, of 1,443 kilometers, you know, from the shores of Lake Albert in Uganda through to the coast of Tanga in Tanzania. Um, and, and in the context of this campaign, uh, we have and, and continue to draw out the risks, uh, the harm, the dispossession, uh, you know, the, the violence and the corruption uh, that is both produced and reproduced uh, by this project. Uh, and in doing so, we have established ourselves and our coalition as, as a barrier which has uh, been effective and, and at the very least um, has served to delay, you know, the completion of, of this project. Um, now, anyone who understands the issue of climate uh, should know and appreciate the ways in which the uh, exacerbation of the climate crisis, which is, of course, you know, fueled by projects such as ECOP, uh, will in turn work alongside those very same uh, projects as well as their impacts to significantly uh, deepen levels of poverty and insecurity, you know, displacing um, almost incomprehensible number of communities and, and generally will just exacerbate every single socioeconomic issue that, that we could think of. Um, and I think that is a fundamental point that I'm sure most of us here understand. Um, and it's why so many of us have taken up this issue and have given of ourselves in, in struggle and in resistance to, to confront it. Um, the reality, however, uh, is that there are still so, so many people who do not fully understand that point. Uh, nor the gravity of the crisis that we are confronted by. And, and while the climate movement continues to grow each day, and of course, as more and more people are hit by the devastating impacts of climate change, uh, you know, they're also becoming increasingly radicalized uh, by the issue. Um, and even while this is the case, our, our movements, in my view, have still not done enough to draw out these links and connections to create a truly um, mass-based, you know, popular social movement for climate justice. Um, and for me, in some ways, uh, this is evident, at least for me, uh, in that, you know, look, recently we've seen uh, an amazing number of 75,000 people out in the streets in New York and, and close to 3,000 people in the streets uh, of Nairobi during the African Climate Summit, uh, which, of course, is huge. And this is something that hasn't been seen before in the climate space. Uh, but it, it's also simply not enough, right? Sure, both of these, these feats are absolutely worthy of celebration. Um, but when we are confronting an issue that literally impacts every single person on the planet, um, we need our movements to be able to mobilize in the hundreds of thousands um, and even in the millions. Um, and I think, you know, this is especially true in Africa, uh, where we have to ask ourselves why, you know, on the continent, which stands to be the hardest hit uh, by climate change and a, a continent of what, one and a half billion people, um, only 3,000 showed up to what was, you know, branded as Africa's climate march. Um, and personally, I've I've always felt that the issue of climate has been somewhat abstract. Um, I didn't think that we on the African continent had the luxury of concerning ourselves with climate change while our people are unemployed, while families can't put food on the table, while children are drowning in feces at the bottom of pit latrines, uh, you know, while students are crammed into classes of 80 to 100 people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's only when I did some work in a small community called Snake Park in Soweto in Johannesburg uh, that these views began to change. And there I saw the front lines of extraction in South Africa and the ways in which extractive industries exploit and devastate our people, uh, you know, fueling the crisis of joblessness, of health, of food insecurity, of gender-based violence, uh, you know, among other things. Um, and after this experience brought me into the climate movement, I realized that it, it, it is hard to mobilize people around the issue of climate, uh, especially in the context of Africa. Uh, our ideas are sometimes abstract and our, our jargon can be alienating. Um, our fights against, against the, the projects of industry are so, so important and we know that. Um, but we've also seen these fights pit Africans against other Africans. Um, and while we know that these projects will do nothing but destroy and they will bring nothing but um, but despair. Uh, for many others, uh, at least at face value, these projects, projects like ECOP, are seen as a, as a hallmark of development. Um, and proponents would argue that we need the infrastructure, we need the resources, the jobs, in order to meet our interlocking crises of hunger, of homelessness, and, and of unemployment. Um, and in our opposition and in our resistance, they would then turn around and slander us as anti-developmental 
as neo-colonial agents, you know, working to undermine the growth of Africa. And of course, this is ridiculous, right? And we know that the only agents of neo-colonialism and, and deliberate underdevelopment are the extractive industries themselves, are, you know, the, the multinational profiteers and, and, and even the African leaders who facilitate their interests. Um, but, but regardless of that, uh, in, in, in our experience, I think we also know that this counter logic that is used against us tends to resonate with many people on the continent. And it's part of the reason why it has become so important for the climate justice movement to adopt a truly intersectional approach, uh, you know, using the crisis of climate as an opportunity to address all other socioeconomic issues. Uh, it is why the primary role of the climate justice movement should be to inspire a climate agenda within other social movements, bringing fights for jobs, for food, for land, for healthcare, for education to the fore of our agenda, while also highlighting the ways in which we can attain these developmental feats, uh, you know, without extractive, destructive and, and exploitative projects, uh, without the profiteering logic of the fossil fuel industry, and without fossil fuels entirely. Um, and by championing uh, renewable energy, for instance, we aren't just advocating for a sustainable environment, uh, but also for the creation of jobs. You know, we're building resilience in communities, ensuring that a farmer has food on the table, even in times of unpredictable weather, and guaranteeing a you know future where our children have roofs over their heads, sheltered from from the wrath of of natural disasters. Um, I think. It's also important that we must be very clear here to assert that we cannot allow industry to, to lead the charge on renewables, because um, that would simply be the, the perpetuation of injustice. Uh, in Africa, we, we, we need and, and will fight for real African solutions for decentralized, socially owned renewable energy systems, which are contextual, culturally appropriate, and which are designed with the sole purpose of, of meeting the needs of our people. Um, and climate solutions then, when we do that, are not detached idealistic dreams. Uh, they are intertwined with the, you know, the very bread and butter issues uh, which touch every African household. Uh, they form the building blocks of a just society where, where resources aren't pillaged, but rather they are shared and where the environment isn't an externality, but is central to, to you know, uh, every policy decision. Um, I think just in conclusion, because I know I've taken some time, um, we have a beautiful opportunity here. Uh, with power up and with this mobilization and, 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 and in us coming together with this emphasis and focus um, as we you know, seek to move to power up every corner of the globe, uh, we have an opportunity to build a movement whose, whose songs will sound in the halls of history. Um, you know, one which does not stop uh, in its fight against the drivers of climate change, uh, but which also has the ability to shake the core of our entire system. Uh, you know, which offers resistance against the degradation of our planet, uh, a pushback against the odds which are stacked against the most vulnerable and marginalized of people in our societies, and, and which offers a challenge to the idea that the fate of the earth is sealed. Um, and this is a movement which, which really gives us an opportunity to, to mobilize, uh, you know, in vast, vast numbers to move beyond the challenges that we've encountered when it comes to, uh, in, in terms of building the climate justice movement on the African continent, uh, to build a developmental movement, uh, which is set to fight for a world that is truly beautiful, uh, prosperous, uh, and just. Uh, let, me, let me leave it at that. Thank you very much. So powerful, Zaki. Thank you. We must connect. We must connect across movements for justice, across climate, land, economic, social justice, for the world we want to see. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take us to another part of the world. Uh, let's move to Brazil with our fantastic next speaker, Perry Diaz. Perry is a Brazilian journalist working for more than 10 years in the environmental movement in Latin America. He's the Latin American communications manager with us at 350.org. And he's going to tell us about the power of action in Rio de Janeiro. Perry. Thank you, Bridget. It's so good to be here. Um, and I love to hear Jacinta and Zaki speaking about um, their regions because I see, I see lots of uh, similarities with what we see in Latin America as well. But I want to take us uh, to Rio de Janeiro, as Bridget mentioned. I want to take us for a walk along the beaches of Rio. I'll, I'll tell a short story 
I wrote something here and I want you to come with me. So imagine a hot day in those beautiful beaches that we always see in the pictures of Rio de Janeiro, the crowd having fun and the wind, and it's very fun and vibrant. It's so relaxing, right? But imagine, and you should know that uh, this city that is the symbol of Brazil and where more than 10 million people live is also a territory of fight, fight for social, environmental, and climate justice. And uh, we're talking about several communities that fight for that. For example, in the metropolitan area of Rio de Janeiro, there are tens of thousands of families that make a living from artisanal fishing. And uh, this work that they do is incredibly important because they feed um, the region's residents and they, they're also keeping alive a very, um, a very important traditional culture that is based in knowledge sharing and in solidarity as well. And these families have, have been suffering for decades from the impact of oil and gas in the region. Um, Rio de Janeiro is located in the Guanabara Bay, right? Um, and in this bay, there is a large oil refinery that is fed by a huge uh, network of uh, oil of pipelines, oil pipelines, and of huge ships that uh, circulate nonstop in that bay and that make the work of these fishers incredibly difficult because they literally rock their boat, right? Um, and besides that, uh, the oil spills in that area are frequent, uh, and many of these oil spills actually result from uh, intentional and criminal disposal by these ships. So it's really absurd and impressive. The waters become polluted, the fish dies, and uh, the fishers end up paying the price for that. So these communities have been denouncing um, this neglect for the environment uh, for more than two decades. But we know fossil fuel companies are so powerful in terms of using their money and their resources to intimidate communities. And at times they manage to suffocate the voices of these fishers. So 350 has been working with this community, uh, these communities actually, for years. Um, and we work with the main association of fishers there in that area, which is called Almar, to amplify their fight. And these are the communities that will lead um, our Power Up campaign in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Almar, this organization. Almar means men and women of the sea of the Guanabara Bay. I think it's a beautiful name um, because it's poetic, right? Men and women of the sea, it's beautiful. But it, but it, I think it also reveals their um, extremely strong, their visceral connection uh, with the sea. Uh, they see, th these fishers see the sea as uh, an extension of their homes and of their bodies. Uh, this is how important the sea is for them. And uh, in November, uh, these are the men and women who will uh, participate in this action. They will sail their boats to a well-known location uh, on the shore of Rio de Janeiro, and they will stage their protests from there, from this uh, very sea that they protect, that they are defending. So we think it will be an action uh, that will uh, claim for system change, of course, but it, but it is also a beautiful testimony of the strength uh, and of the beauty of this movement, right? Um, so they're calling basically for a fair energy transition in Brazil, because this fair energy transition will allow this oil spills and this intimidation to be in the past. They're asking for real development because the jobs and activities that uh, that they have are not as good as the ones that they could have. I mean, the, the community's jobs are not as good as the ones that they could have um, if the the oil and gas industry wasn't there. So they're calling for real development there for jobs and for activities that do not destroy uh, the environment. And finally, they're asking also for uh, a shift in the resources, the way the resources are used there, uh, because these uh, resources, including subsidies, are used today to feed oil and gas, and they want these resources to be uh, redirected to uh, a, a just energy transition. So they're basically saying no more subsidies for the climate crisis, and we want our money to be used to be to build a fair world for everyone. That's the message of this um, of this action that we're going to have in Rio. And just to wrap up, uh, we're going to have other actions in Latin America as well. We're going to have actions in other parts of Brazil, including um, the Amazon forest. We're excited about that too. Um, and we're going to have actions in Argentina, Colombia, and Bolivia as well. And we think that these communities. Uh, are showing that uh, Latin America is a territory of fight for justice and for solutions as well for, for the climate crisis. Thank you, Bridget. I cannot wait to see the action that the people of the sea pull off. I am so excited for the 3rd and 4th of November to see that. 
Thank you, Perry. Um, I have great respect and admiration for our final speaker, Rochetta Ozan. She is the founder of the Vessel Project of Louisiana, uh, the Gulf Fossil Finance Coordinator with the Texas Campaign for the Environment Fund. She's an internationally recognized speaker advocating for clean air, clean water, sustainable communities, particularly for Black, Indigenous and people of colour. Um, but perhaps as, as a mother myself, I hold in special regard that Rochetta is also a single mother of six. And, and we all share that we want to leave a better world for our children. So Rochetta, over to you to share why and how you're powering up in New Orleans. Good morning, everyone. Yes, so I am Rochetta Ozan. Of course, I am here um, located in Sulphur, Louisiana, which is in southwest Louisiana. And southwest Louisiana is a five parish area that's intersecting the Acadiana and central Louisiana regions. It is composed of Allen Parish, Beauregard Parish, um, Calcasieu Parish, Cameron Parish, and Jefferson um, Davis Parish. As of 2020, the combined population of the five parish area where I live was 313,951. So if you think about that in context and in the area where I live, and you think about we have more than 12 petrochemical facilities, three LNG facilities, we were just approved for this new direct air capture hub, and we have this big spaghetti bowl of pipeline already in this area that's low income, uh, more than 46% uh, black, low income white. People here are shrimpers and um, oystermen, and they live off of the land and off of the water here. But yet, in the last several years, the United States has become the largest exporter of methane gas in the world. Methane gas, like all fossil fuel pollution, has significant health impacts on Black, Indigenous, and people of color community. And that's where these facilities are largely um, this is where they're built in these type of communities. And the U.S. continues to approve um, these type of uh, facilities. In Lake Charles, in the Lake Charles area where I live, where roughly half of the 80,000 res residents are Black, the industry wants to build four new um, LNG or methane gas export terminals within roughly five miles of one another. And Lake Charles is not alone, as more than 20 um, new or expanded LNG terminals are slated to come online within the next decade, entirely in or near communities of color. Yet as these communities are literally fighting for our lives on the front lines of climate change, U.S. banks are continuing to fund the fossil fuel industry. So we have the U.S. government who's approving these new facilities by issuing our permits, and then we have U.S. banks that are funding these same industries. We are here to say as frontline folks that enough is enough. We will no longer be sacrificed by big banks such as JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley. We will also hold those in government accountable for approving these industries that are killing us in our communities. We want to send a message to President Biden that it is time to phase out fossil fuels. It is time to declare a climate emergency and it is time to expense funds into communities that are disproportionately impacted by the decisions that are made by government. And so on November the 4th in New Orleans, we are coming together as frontline folks from along the Gulf Coast, which includes Texas, Louisiana, Florida, and Mississippi, we're coming together to say that we are not your sacrifice. We are coming to show that frontline folks have a voice. We are impacted. Our children are dying from asthma and cancer. Our elders are dying from cancer and other respiratory um, issues because we're breathing in toxic air. We're drinking unclean water. Right now, also in Louisiana, we are facing a salt water intrusion because um, the salt is getting into, is, is heading into the drinking water. There has been a state of emergency declared for Louisiana because of that salt water intrusion. What else um, does it have to take to show that people are being impacted by the decision to continue to roll out new fossil fuel industries? 
enough is enough. So on our um not not only on November 4th, will we be calling on President Biden to declare this climate emergency and phase out fossil fuels, we are also going to be showing the world why we fight for this place, why we call this place home, why we love the Gulf Coast. We're going to be showing our culture here, some great music, some second line dancing. If you all have ever heard of New Orleans and ever wanted to visit New Orleans and you want to come here because of Mardi Gras, because of the festival, that is the experience you're going to get because when we talk about how do we win the first step to winning is what you all did today is showing up the second step to winning is supporting each other supporting our fight um, telling the story of how what's happening in the deep south of the united states is directly related to what's happening in the global south of the world telling our stories, telling our stories collectively. The third way that we win is to continue to use joy as a strategy. I know it feels like that we are not winning because we are not, uh, because uh, new fossil fuel industries are constantly being approved, but we are winning. When we look at events like Climate Week and we see that we had over 75,000 people in the streets, when we see that there were more than 600 actions happening collectively on the same day, on se in several different countries, on all seven continents, we are winning. We have to continue to tell our stories. We have to tell the story of how the train that derailed in Ohio is the same train that comes through Westlake, Louisiana, where I live. And the contents of that train are ships on ships and barges across the world to Africa and to Germany. And we have to make these stories stick in the minds of the people who are making the decisions that directly impact our lives. I could speak all day. At the end of the day, I'm doing this because I am a mom. I have six children. Some of my children have asthma. Some of them have eczema, uh, which is a skin condition. I also have a grandbaby. We're no longer talking about generations far away. The people we're trying to save, the generations we're trying to save, are here now. We need to also finally incorporate and include the youth that we continue to talk about saving the world for. They have to be a part of the story. They have to be on the front lines with us. Don't be afraid to use the youth because we may not see um, the, the, the rewards of our labor in our time, but if we um, empower and educate the youth that we're saving this world for now, they will be the leaders of tomorrow who will continue to tell our story and continue to fight. I've started with my six children. You've probably seen that some of them are youth activists. My daughter Cammie has a video on YouTube that you can go and watch of her showing a, a tour of our community and all of the facilities that are um, plaguing us. My daughter Keandria works with the Vessel Project, knocking on doors educating folks about what's going on in the community. My daughter, Camille, has a story in Teen Vogue, and you can read the story of how her very own environment is killing her and poisoning her body, and it's literally killing the skin from her body because of the, the toxins in the air. And you, and you, too, can start at your um, dinner table with your own children, with your own friends, and with your family. Continue to fight. Celebrate small wins. Know that we are winning. Know that we are in this together. And we look forward to seeing some of you on November 4th in the uh, great state of Louisiana, here on the Gulf Coast, in the wonderful city of New Orleans, celebrating, but also standing up to say that we are not sacrifices. It is time to phase out fossil fuels and it is time to help these communities to thrive. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, Rochetta. Let's show up. Let's fight for our homes. Let's stand in solidarity for each other's homes. And let's use joy as a strategy. Thank you so much. Um, so you've heard about the amazing reasons and actions from around the world to power up. Um, now, this is the moment where we're going to talk about how you can ramp up your involvement. I pass over to my esteemed co-workers in 350.org. Clemence Dubois uh, is Associate Director of Global Campaigns. And... Uh, Emil Tucker Alpai is Global Mobilization Coordinator. They'd be going through how you can get involved in Power Up.
Thank you, Bridget, and thank you, everyone, for your inspiring speeches. Uh, I will be talking about how you can get involved in Power Up. Uh, there are actually two ways. You can organize your own action, just as people talked about previously in this webinar, or you can join an action near to you. Uh, so uh, to organize an action, you should need to go to Power Up website. Uh, and can you can you go with this? Thank you. Uh, to organize an action, you can go to our website. Uh, and on the website, you will see the organize. You can click on the organize an action, and you will see this uh, page there. You can modify all this here. You can you will write your event name, the date, and the time of the event. We already provide a, a description, event description for you, but it's totally modifiable. You can change it, you can write your uh, events detail, or you can use this uh, this event description that we, that, uh, we uh, provided. Uh, after you register your action, this will go to uh, the your regional uh, third, uh, 350 team, and they will approve uh, the, approve the uh, registration. Once approved, uh, your light, your light, you will have a lightning bolt on the globe, and your lightning bolt will shine with the others all around the globe with other like more than hundred actions, and hopefully, will uh, will uh, the number uh, will uh, increase. And also, you will be able to track the people who are joining your action that you are organizing. Uh, if you have any questions, creating. Uh, this registering to events, you can contact us uh, at organizer.globalpowerup.org, which which will also show you the uh, website address and also this email address at the end of the the present presentation. And so, but also we will have we have a FAQ uh, doc document in the resources that we provided, which, uh, yeah. And we have a lot of resources which could, which will help your action to be a success. Uh, these these are the, these are the resources for organizers. We have organizers toolkit, and there are many kits and many toolkits and guides in this organizer toolkit, uh, which includes our toolkit, communication toolkit. Also, we have logistics and safety toolkit, and all the other toolkits and uh, and many more. In that, also we have some promotion materials. Uh, the next slide, please. Thank you. Also, we have the promotion materials, which we have, which includes visual guidelines, logos. Also, where is the money fact sheets? And we have promotion uh, videos with this. And of course, also uh, amazing artists all around the globe. Next slide, please. Uh, you will see that from Philippines, from Indonesia, contributed with their wonderful, powerful artwork for Power Up. You are seeing Philippines and Indonesia in the page now, and there are more others. Next slide, please. Yeah, from Singapore, from Brazil, Burkina Faso, and the next slide, please. And France and Kenya. Uh, all. All these are like you can uh, you can use uh, in your uh, to promote your actions and promote power up. If you can't uh, organize an action for some reason, uh, always you can join an action near you. For this, you will use the the map on the website. Just click on the join action uh, section there, and then you will come to this page. You can just write your city name, state or country or zip or postal code, and you will see the nearest action. And you can uh, RSVP to, to this action. Uh, yeah, okay. the next slide, please. This is, yeah, you, when you click on the light, one of the lightning bolts that's the nearest to you, you will see this uh, join uh, the, the actions page. And then when you click join, you will go to RSVP our SVP page, which is in the next slide. And when you fill this and 
click sign up you will be sign you will be uh, the, the host of the action will be um, informed and they will uh, communicate with you about joining the action uh yes can we go just a little bit further okay yeah this is all by me sorry for being quick but i think we didn't have more time for that so join us and see you there with like other thousands of people on the streets on in the cities all around the globe under lightning wells thank you Clemence, over to you Yes, hello everybody. And I was uh, really moved and I assume like many of you to hear all those stories of fights across the world and to think that we're all going to be showing up on the 3rd and the 4th of November when the fossil fuel industry um, will celebrate another round of profits that are made uh, from disrupting our climate, our lands, our lives. And so that's what Power Up is also about. It's about not only reclaiming our future, but reclaiming our lives, our collective power, and um, yeah, our collective power to build the the real revolution that we need and that will change our our lives. And so I know it can be scary to uh, to start an event. Uh, a, you you have seen on the map there are plenty that are already being organized but we we hope to see many more and that's the beauty of the global day of action it doesn't need to be big it's we just need to be all together and to create opportunities for people to show up and so on our website as Emil show you uh just show you there is tons there are tons of resources that you can use and including concept ideas, tactics that could fit uh, your your context um, because we we know that we that we come with like many different contexts all of us we we've heard it today again. but that doesn't mean that you know we uh, we can't fight against the same enemy and so and also share our dreams together and be hopeful in our anger. So our map and with the many dots that you will see will also give you visibility to recruit new people to join because hopefully those days of actions are also to strengthen our uh, our groups, our mobilization. Maybe you're alone today, but thanks to this mobilization and all the many others that uh, will create all together in the future, we will strengthen our our groups and be uh, more and more along the day. Um, so what's going to happen as well is that on that day, 350.org is going to amplify uh, your action and people's action. So we are going to build and to share the visibility uh, with our messages that are really strong, with our cre uh, creativity. And uh, we also want to, to to have this media visibility across the world. Uh, so you'll find on the website as well some uh, messages that you can tailor then to your own context. We have those facts that are called where is the money to show that we're not only utopist. We are also really grounded into a reality that we, we need to change. Um, and yeah, finally, we know that the fossil fuel industry have the billions, but we know that we are the power. And so the, we need more people to organize. And so that's why we also encourage you to think about the next steps after the action uh, so that we can you know, move together as a movement afterwards as well. Thank you, Clemence. I just want to say thank you so much uh, for all the contributions we've had so far. Uh, now I'm going to ask Iris to share with us how she's captured in her live drawing the exhilarating vision that our speakers have conjured for us today. Uh, Iris, can I pass to you to sh share your screen? Hi. <clears throat> Hello. Um, normally you should be able to see my screen, um, and if you like, you can pin it. I'm just going to go over very quickly 
a couple of the key, no, uh, key points from each of the speakers because a lot was said. Uh, the, from the first speaker from Fabiana, I think the main thing that came out of there is the fact that we really must listen, that the new future is really uh, ready and, and it's on the ground. We just need to basically listen to resources that are already there and then work together to kind of bring those out. Um, then we had um, Bridget really bringing forward, you know, the idea of saying yes, not always saying no, and yes in my backyard, um, and that that support for three for the tripling the amount of renewable energy really needs to be coming from governments, um, but that we really need to be bringing that forward as much as possible. We heard from uh, Yacinta saying that we need to um, really show that you know there's so much appetite for action, and we just need to bring everybody together to really pick a side. We had Saki um, telling us about how we must show the links and connections between different groups. That we need an intersectional approach. And um, we need to really show that integration has to be a form of resistance. Um, and then also highlighted really nicely there was is that like we have such a nice, a beautiful opportunity for justice um, in this fight. Um, then we had um, we had Perry from coming in from um, Rio de Janeiro talking about linking, um, you know, fishermen to the climate uh, fight here, um, talking about the action around people of the sea, um, really taking on the oil refinery that intimidates local fishers and pollutes uh, in a way that's really not acceptable, and just sort of imagining the uh, the actions of those coming together. Uh, we also had uh, Rochetta um, coming to us from Louisiana calling on Biden to have to to basically um, declare a state of emergency around climate um, and just showing the way that um, there's such racial injustice with these fossil fuel facilities being built in these um, community communities of color um, showing that it's really about you know talking about here and now is that we need action it's enough and is enough and we need to bring youth into this um, this fight. Then um, we were talking with Emel about, you know, how to do it. So this is just how saying that we have the tool the toolkits and we have the resources. So uh, everything's there to take action and that it really is about reclaiming our future, which is what Clemence uh, um, talked about, uh, that it really doesn't matter if it's a big or small action. It's just about it being together and um, that we can that, uh, of course, your action will be amplified. So this is a very, very quick overview of all your uh, points. Um, I'll be sharing all the illustrations, of course, into one big illustration um, after the call. Wow, Iris, that is just stunning and beautiful. And what a stunning time it's been together um, to all of our speakers, to everyone that was joining from, I've seen people online from Nigeria, UK, Benin, USA, Japan, Philippines, Granada, France. Let's do this. Thank you for being part of this. If you do one thing today after this call, Go to the map, find an event near you, RSVP to the event you want to go to, or be brave, register one, get your community involved and do it yourself. Let's do this. Let's uh, go to globalpowerup.org for all the resources and support you need. Email contact at globalpowerup.org if you need any support. We can't wait to join you on the 3rd and 4th of November to power up. That's it. Thank you, everyone.